We invite you to open your Bibles this morning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, particularly verses 13 to 18. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. We will not give reading to this passage at the beginning of our message, but I do want you to have your Bibles open and have that passage available. And perhaps while you're looking for it, I can use a few moments to welcome you to our worship service here today. We're glad you're here. And it's good to see some visitors. We especially welcome you. If you would, we would like to have a record of your visit. And there is a guest register uh, on the desk out in the foyer. By way of reminder to some of you who are visiting, every second and fourth Sunday we have two services with lunch <coughs> in between. We sure would like for you to plan to be with us next Sunday and plan to stay and have lunch and be our guest. We usually have plenty. So you come and uh, join with us in worship and then, if you would, in a time of fellowship afterwards. By way of review, as you know, those of you who have been attending regularly, we are in a series of expositional sermons on the book of First Thessalonians. This passage that I've asked you to have available, uh, the larger context of the passage, we see that the apostle in chapters 4 and chapter 5 is dealing with the subject, the general subject, of the walk or life of the believers. A walk, a life that should have as its focus not their own blessing or personal happiness, but a walk and a life pleasing to God who has redeemed them. He has declared unto them that he not only instructed them how to walk, but he exhorts them to do so. And he expands on the original teaching in order that they as believers might not only make a small effort in that direction, no, 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 but that they would abound. That means to be filled up to overflowing with such a walk as pleases to God. He deals right away in some practical areas, indicating that a walking, a life that pleases God is not something mystical, some indiscernible experience, but it is very practical and touches areas that the apostle deals with in chapters 4 and 5. He deals with, first of all, the issue of sexual purity. Then he deals with the issue of brotherly love. He also deals with the issue of sanctified industriousness. And now, in verse 13, he deals with this area of grief at the loss of a loved one. You see, we are to please God even in that. His subject is not dealing with, as such, the second coming of Christ directly. His subject is those who fall asleep in Christ and his particular concern that believers do not grieve as unbelievers. So he says, in setting out his purpose, we would not have you uninformed. We would not have you ignorant about these things, about those who fall asleep, that is, who die in Christ. That you sorrow not as the rest. The rest 
the rest who have no hope. In verses 14 to 17, Paul proceeds to accomplish his purpose. And he says, I would not have you ignorant. I would not have you uninformed. So what does he do about it? Well, he gives them facts. He gives them information. Information. Facts that they need to know regarding their dead loved ones. Now, I emphasize that at this point. For this reason, listen carefully. Whatever he says about the second coming, he says only so far as it relates to the subject of dead loved ones. Particularly the relationship they will have to their living brothers and sisters and their loved ones in Christ. Now in verse 14, he states the doctrine generally. So you may look at your Bibles there in verse 14. For if, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. This is a general statement of the doctrine. And it focuses upon the glorious truth, the glorious truth of union with Christ. In essence, what he is saying is that wherever Christ is, so are your loved ones who died in Christ. So that when he appears, they will be with him. That's the doctrinal teaching. And it's this if Paul knows this, this sets your heart at rest. He expands upon it. In verses 15 to 17, he gives the specifics of that general doctrine. And it is based upon, I want to you to know special revelation. How did Paul come by this information? By special revelation. Look at verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. The Lord had revealed it to the apostle. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. You see, this word that Paul has from the Lord is something that had not been previously revealed. Not the truth of the resurrection. Not even the truth of the second coming. But the precise relationship of living believers to dead believers at the second coming. This is what had been revealed. It's called a mystery in 1 Corinthians. You know 1 Corinthians 15, the chapter that deals with the resurrection. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Paul again writing says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Well, of course, mystery in Scripture refers to something not previously revealed. So in our text, by the word of the Lord, Paul corrects a false notion. Well, that's as far as we got last week. Now, in expanding the doctrine in specific de details, the first thing he does is to clear away wrong doctrine, false concepts. Notice again, 1 Thessalonians 4.15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord 
shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. You see, he's clearing away this notion. He's redirecting their thinking that somehow living saints would have a priority, a higher standing, a first-class citizenship in the kingdom of Christ. Paul is dispelling that notion. He clears away the idea, and perhaps we need to think about that this morning. What he's doing is clearing away the idea that the most blissful state is to be alive when the Lord comes. We tend to think that, do we not? Well, if we're alive and when the Lord comes, don't have to go through death. Paul's actually saying that's not necessarily the best. Not necessarily. Because those of us who are alive, in fact, there is almost a veiled use of the language here. It's pretty subtle. Perhaps we could literally render it, those of us who are left, we might even go so far as to say the leftovers, as opposed to those who have gone on by death. Paul kind of views the ones who are still here alive as the leftovers. It's very subtle, but it's there. You see, we who are alive and remain will have no advantage over those who are asleep. Now this brings us to verse 16, which is the positive delineation of the specific facts of what happens to the dead loved ones when? At the coming of Christ. What's going to happen to them? So you see, having cleared away the misconception, he now seeks to lay on their cleared minds the right concepts of truth. The facts. The facts. As they really are. So please look with me in your Bibles at verse 16 through 18 of First Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort, comfort one another with these words. So, a quick overlook again at what we've looked at. Having considered Paul's purpose, verse 13. The general statement of the doctrine, verse 14. The beginning of the specific statement clearing away the misconception, verse 15. Now, this morning we come to expound the true state of affairs, particularly with regard to dead loved ones at the coming of Christ. Again, I remind you, this is not in and of itself teaching about the second commandment, I'm sorry, the second coming in general. Let me just explain that. In the verses that we are considering, there is not of it enough information to satisfy all of the questions that we might have about the second coming. Now, we're not avoiding the issue. We're moving in that direction. If you've read through the First Thessalonians, we'll be coming to those verses that deal more with the second coming of Christ. So, stay tuned in. Be here next Sunday and the next Sunday, and we will be dealing with those issues. But what we're saying here is there's not enough information in these short verses to deal with all of the questions concerning eschatology. However, 
There's enough information here, dear ones, to comfort those who have lost loved ones. And that's what Paul is driving at. To bring comfort. To bring real and true consolation when death strikes our loved ones. Now, we have a lot of information to cover this morning. The first thing that we want to look at is the one who comes. Who is it that's coming? Well, look at verse 16. For the Lord himself. That's who's coming. It's the Lord himself. And in the, in the original language of Greek, it's pretty emphatic. In fact, it could be translated more literally, for himself, the Lord put in that order. It gives emphasis. In other words, having established the general doctrine that the comfort of the Christian is rooted in union with Christ, we believe that he died and rose, that they who fall asleep in God, will he will bring with them. But notice, Paul puts the emphasis on the Lord, the Lord himself. Whatever happens to your dead loved ones and happens to you in terms of who is first or who is left, he says, as it were, put those considerations aside for the moment. And the vital factor to consider in Paul's mind, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is the one who comes. Who does he refer to him as? What name? Jesus. Jesus. And notice verse 14. That's the one, I, that's the verse I'm making reference to. He does call him Lord there in that verse that we're considering, but notice in verse 14. And this is important for our purposes. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. The name Jesus used without the words Lord and Christ refer to his humanity. They refer to his humanity in his weakness as the God-man suffering, bleeding, dying, it was Jesus who died and rose again. But who is the one coming back? The Lord. Isn't that interesting? The Lord. He is both Lord and Christ. As we studied in Sunday school earlier this morning, he has been seated upon a mediatorial throne a throne of absolute sovereignty and power, for he now sits and reigns as King of kings, Lord of lords. And that's, who he's, that's who's coming back. That's the one. And do you know what? The last enemy to be destroyed is what? Death. Death. And when you parallel this passage with 1 Corinthians 15... It is at that time in the twinkling of an eye when the last trump sounds and the dead are raised incorruptible. Paul says then at that point shall come to pass that saying, death is swallowed up in victory. What a glorious truth to proclaim. It is the Lord Jesus himself that shall come. But notice, he has some attendants that are coming with him. You say, I don't see that. Well, let's look. 
Um, do you see those attendants? A shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. Those are his three attendants. When he comes, it will be in the midst, in the context of these three things. A shout, a voice, and a trumpet. Let's consider them. Why would we want to consider them? Because God put them here, believe it or not, as a source of comfort. Can we find comfort in a shout? Can we find comfort in a voice of an archangel? Is there any comfort in a trumpet? Well, God put them there for that purpose. He says, comfort one another with these words. What does a shout, a voice, a trump have to do with the comfort of the saints? Let's think about the word shout. What is that word in scripture? How is it used? What does it refer to? Most often in scripture, it is used for a verbal command given by a ruler to a subject, given by a superior to an inferior. It is the word used that Pilate used when he commanded that the body of Jesus should be taken down from the cross. Same word. It's used of the jailer when he, they commanded the jailer that he should beat the apostle. And the whole con general context of this word that is used is that of a command of a superior to an inferior. It is someone who speaks with authority. What is that shout? In our text, the Lord himself in a shout. Well, I want to uh, ask you to turn to John chapter 5 because I believe we have some scripture here that will help us understand John chapter 5 and let's look at verse 28 and 29 Christ is speaking do not marvel at this for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs shall hear his voice. Could that be the shout? Could that be the shout? Verse 29, and shall come forth those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Our Lord goes on to say, that these dead ones will come forth. What then is the shout? I would like to suggest that it probably has reference to this very utterance of Christ. That when he comes, it will be in the context of a shout that will literally wake the dead. What a shout. Do we have any examples of this? We do. I hope you're thinking about Lazarus. A Lazarus. You remember Lazarus died. And uh, Jesus stands in the presence of the guests that were there to mourn. There is the decaying body of Lazarus the weeping loved ones, the Son of God weeping as well. What does, Lazarus, what does Christ do? Lazarus, come forth. Is that a shout? I would think so. It's a giving of a command. 
That's an authority giving a command. He didn't speak a suggestion. I would like to suggest that maybe you come forth. Lazarus, come forth. Now, remember, Paul is writing instruction of how believers can be comforted. And he says to them, Christ is coming in a shout. Christ is coming in a shout. It will be with a shout. Ah, oh, those dead loved ones will recognize that voice. They will come forth. And then Paul says, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another. Why? Because the Lord himself will bring with him those disembodied spirits. <clears throat> but the shout will cause the graves to give up the dead. And the spirits are joined with the body. Now, we come to the archangel. And the archangel is a bit more difficult to trace out. The only references we have, basically, we have Michael called a prince in Daniel 13. And in Jude 9, we read of Michael, the archangel, also in Revelation 12, 7. And as far as I know, those are probably the only references. The one in Revelation 12, 7 says, And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war. So where's the comfort? Paul brings these words for comfort. There's a shout, but there's the voice of the archangel. Well, let me suggest what I believe is the basis of comfort in these words. We're going to have to trace it out, and I beg your attention. There seems to be a matter of rank and order among the angels. Therefore, angels are what they are declared to be in Scripture. Those sent forth to service for the heirs of salvation. They are as ministering servants to meet the needs of God's saints. When in this hour, when some of the most basic needs of the saints will be met, it is not surprising that angels should be connected with meeting the needs of those who are suffering the death of loved ones. In fact, turn with me to Matthew 24, 31. Matthew 24, 31. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they... The angels will do what? Gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. You see, if the angels are going out to gather together the elect, and it seems to have reference to the living elect, and if no angel goes out without submitting to his superior, could it be, could it be, that the orders are given by the ark angel and all of the angels in obedience gather the elect of God. Well, we see that the angels will play a role, but we must hurry on. The last factor is the trump of God. It's going to be in the midst of a shout, the midst of the archangel, the trump of God. What is the significance of the trump or trumpet? Well, there are two basic sig significance of the trumpet in Scripture. On some occasion, it is used to call attention to the unusual manifestation of the presence of God that's found in Exodus. Here was an unusual manifestation of the presence of God 
Back in Exodus 19.16, there was a thunder and lightning, things that are all audible, things to the ear and to the eye. And then there was this very loud trumpet sound, so much so that it caused fear. It's an unusual manifestation of God. A strong use in the Old Testament seems to be that it was the trump was used to assemble the people of God together. In Numbers 10, God gave specific directions about the forming of two silver trumpets that were supposed to summon the people together. We read a while ago from 1 Corinthians 15 in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. It will be an announcement of unusual manifestation of the glory of God in the person of his dear son and it will be a summoning together of all the people of God of all ages. Well, no doubt there's comfort in the sound of the trumpet. What is the manner of his coming? Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. You see, why is Paul emphasizing all of this? Because for the most part, we as believers, in fact all of us, have only worshipped a veil to Christ. But the day is coming when the Lord himself will descend. And we shall see him. We will be taken up into heaven with him. What a glorious, what a glorious day to look forward to. Now, notice the words in our text, together with him. Do you see the comfort there? That's real comfort. He says that when Christ comes back, those loved ones are going to be with him. And when he does his work of resurrection, we will be with him. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Where will we be caught up together? Where does it say? In the clouds. In the clouds. Why does he put the clouds here? Well, the clouds are many times associated with the unusual manifestations of God's power. It was the pillar of fire by night, the cloud by day, the cloud of Shekinah glory. The prophecies concerning the come of Christ, coming of Christ are often associated with the cloud. Christ himself was received up in a cloud. It's a manifestation of his coming. And why will we be caught up in the clouds? What for? To meet the Lord in the air. We shall go out together to meet the Lord. Well, some would like to think that at that moment, Christ is going to set up his kingdom here on earth. 
Well, come back. We'll talk about that. Others would like it to read, it will escape the tribulation. I'm just giving you some preview. We'll deal with those issues. But the issue that Paul dealt with was comfort, hope. And you know, as you said here this afternoon, do you have hope? Any hope that you'll go to be with Christ? What is that hope based on? I'm asking you to examine your own heart. Is that hope based on you hope everything will work out all right? Is that hope based on your hope your good works will outweigh your bad ones? Is your hope based on the fact that you're as good as most people and probably better than most? Is your hope built on Jesus Christ and Him alone? Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And if you die without that kind of hope, your loved ones will have no real comfort in the hour of death. Paul dispelled their ignorance. Paul gave them doctrine concerning the death and resurrection of Christ. And that, my friend, is the only true basis of hope. And if you don't have Christ today, we urge you, we invite you, come to Christ. Christ said, he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. That's true. Those are the words of Christ himself. Let's pray. Our gracious God, as we've sought to understand this portion of your word concerning the death of our loved ones, may we think about our own death. It's appointed unto men once to die. After that, the judgment. So I pray, Father, that we might be prepared for that day. We pray, Father, that you might, even in these moments as we pray, be gracious to those who are yet outside of Christ. And may this be the time when you would be pleased to, to save them, to quicken them by the power of your Holy Spirit, to grant unto them true spiritual life, Evidence by saving faith and repentance. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>